Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here as usual in the John Hope Franklin Center here in Durham, North Carolina, Duke University. And we're joined today in studio by Bakari Kitwana, well known for his days as the executive editor of The Source magazine, is also an editor at Third World Press, the author of The Hip Hop Generation and also Why White Kids Love Hip Hop. How are you doing today, Bakari? I'm great. I'm great. Good so, to be here. We're in an interesting kind of moment now. Um, you know, it's it's the winding down of the Obama yeah. era, and there are a lot of folks will, that will look historically at 2008 and mark this as this moment where there was this explosion of the black youth vote, right? Black and Latino vote, right? That there was some sort of shift, and and we know, you know, four or five years down the road, no one's really talking about the Obama White House that way. What they're talking about are the Mike Browns. They're talking about Ferguson, they're talking about Baltimore, they're talking about Tamir Rice. Um, talk about how Ferguson has changed our sense of what the Obama presidency has, yeah. has been. I mean, I think that, um, you know, to just go back a little bit in terms of the Obama presidency, um, for, for many of us who are doing the hip hop political work, um, you know, our starting point was how can we uh, have an impact on um, the the national conversation, and how can we how can we change public policy yeah. that's negatively affecting Black folks? And a part of that was to take the power and influence of hip hop as a cultural force that was beginning to move multi platinum right. units within right. individual artists. Right and shift that influence into uh, uh, mainstream electoral politics. And so we began, you know, with several uh, national organizations that emerged around the same time, 2003, 2004, um, the uh, League of Young Voters, right. the National Hip Hop Political Convention. Which you were a co-founder. Right? That's right, Hip Hop Summit Action Network, and um, uh, the Hip Hop Congress. And so, within the National Hip Hop Political Convention, you know, our thinking was voting was the most radical thing that we were going to be able to get young people in our generation to do. Mm, right. And a, part, a large part of that was because our generation was so closely related to or, or, or so not so far removed from the Cointo Pro. Right. So we knew to be young and black and political had consequences right. that were very serious. And, and so we're still- So voting is safe in a, in a certain kind of, right. And, exactly, and, and, right. exactly. But at the same time, we felt that, you know, vote, voting was the most radical thing we were gonna get people to do. We felt that um, by getting people to vote, it would begin to expose the contradictions of the system. Right. And, and I think right now, in the aftermath or in the last years of Obama, we're really seeing that Those at a very right, heightened right, level. Right, you know what I'm saying? Right. So I think when you get conversations like whether or not the uh, superdelegates are going to vote the same way as the, uh, po as the, the popular uh, vote, right. you know what I'm saying? Like this, these are the type of contradictions that we wanted to expose because I think you get to a place where you can have a more uh, robust conversation you can move the nation's agenda towards democracy right. in a way that we really haven't seen in our lifetime. I, I mean, think about it, right? We're, we live in a representational, a representational democracy, and yet we're seeing primaries where individual candidates can win all of the delegates. Right. <laughs> you know, if, right. if they simply get a majority, right? right? And, instead of a more fairly distributed way. Yeah. And that clearly is something that's set up by the individual parties right. to be able to take advantage of those folks who are the front Front, uh, front, uh, front runners. Yeah. yeah. So in, in terms of the youth voter participation, um, we saw from 2000 to 2004 an increase of 9%. Right. From 2004 to 2008, another increase of 4%, but the increase when John Kerry was the candidate more significant than, than the increase Obama, when Obama, Obama was the candidate, which is really important because I think that the conversation within mainstream electoral politics is, was that Obama was the variable that changed the equation. We argue, and I argue in my new book, uh, Hip Hop Activism in the Obama Era, 
that it's young people themselves that change the equation. Right, and they had started that much earlier. They had started then. that well, much earlier. Before Obama <laughs> that's right. Right. That's right. right, that's right. But I think the interesting thing as we make the transition into Ferguson and what people call Black Lives Matter is, you know, I think Obama um, being the candidate made the contradiction even more apparent. Yeah. You know, and I think that for young people who were expecting, you know, we got this black president, and many of those young people worked on their campaign. Um, they, they knocked on doors, they, they registered voters, right. you know what I'm saying? And then you have a president who's black, and you know, that means, that means something from the standpoint, not only is he black, he's, put, he's, he's a person who has a certain level of politics and a certain yeah. level of cultural insight, so he knows the issues in a way that a, that a Hillary Clinton right. and a Bernie, a Bernie Sanders, Sanders right. and a George Bush and a John Kerry are never gonna be right. able to connect to. Right. And so to have that person as a president and to see that you got this thing happening in Ferguson still, and right. you, this guy can't even come to address it in any real way and he's right. saying things like, you know, it's only so much I can do and um, I mean, this is this this I think exposed the contradictions. Right. Even and more. him being very cr critical of folks who were pushing back in the streets, who were dealing with right. you know military forces in their communities. Yeah, right. So some people some people have lodged the criticism that yeah, this younger gener this Black Lives Matter generation has taken things to where um, the hip hop generation never did. But I think that you got to look at the intricacies of that, and some of those intricacies are things like. We had a generation of, of young people who were coming after this Cointel Pro period. Right. We had a generation of young people for whom America, in terms of the e economy, hadn't gotten as bad in the sense that if you were if you were a college uh, person, uh, if you were a college student graduating, late eighties, early nineties, right. there were jobs available. Right. It wasn't a conversation about whether or not you were going to be working in your field, right. let alone whether or right. not you were going to be able to get a job comparable to right. your degree. Right. Black folks were getting mortgages in the early nineties, right? right? Yep. So all of that economic shift, um, I think, lays the foundation, along with the cultural and the political movement of hip hop, for I think Ferguson um, uh, to emerge in, in the way that it did. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Bakari Kidwana, who is the executive director of the National Town Hall Rap Sessions. He is also the author of Why White Kids Love Hip Hop and the Hip Hop Generation. You know, there are a lot of questions about what kind of impact Black Lives Matter is going to have on policy. Right. Right. We know DeRay is running for, DeRay McKeeson is running for mayor in Baltimore, I, I could imagine even some of the folks who came out of Ferguson might think about running for yeah. mayor and city, city council in Ferguson. I, I guess on some level that makes sense. Right. But if we were to point to some real victories that we've seen in this moment, they occur in races that we don't no normally talk about. District attorney races in Chicago, right, with Anita Alvarez, the defeat of Anita Alvarez, right. and then the, a district attorney case in Cleveland where you had two district attorneys who basically prosecuted Tamir Rice and, and other young black folks um, in front of a grand jury. Right. And so those cases never got to see, uh, you know, there's never any indictments, they never get to a jury. And suddenly races that black folks very rarely consider and talk about, you know, low level district attorney races that no one ever talks about suddenly right. are the framework for this generation of folks to yeah. politicize and putting people out of office in this case. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um this, it's interesting uh, the way you, fr you frame the question. Um, you know, I, when I think about the victories of the Black Lives Matter movement, I don't necessarily think about those elections. Those, those, those right. are interesting right. things to talk about. When I think about the victories, I think about you know when you look at the ways the policy conversations have changed about policing. Right. That to me is is where the real victories. Right. Have Body been. armor. Right. Y yeah. I right. mean the com I mean like you had an Obama task force that basically um, you know, re redefines what policing should look like. Now, it's not, they're not implementing it, right. but they have a task force, right. and then they got the Justice Department working in concert, like going in with these in consent the, decrees. Right, with, with, in places like Ferguson. And, right. and in places like Cleveland, right. with a consent decree that basically implement, is calling for the implementation of what was in the task force. And I think a lot of people kind of missed the nuance between yeah. those two things. What's happened, and then the consent decree, going back to the hip hop generation, that came out of the Rodney King, King right. uh, you know, the, the Rodney back King rebellion, right. you know, and, um, and so that leads to this approach to consent decree where basically, you know, the Justice Department comes in, the folks are doing wrong in terms of their uh, policing, in terms right. of civil rights, 
and the consent decree is basically an agreement between the city and the Justice Department yeah. that the police force is going to uh, uh, abide by certain things instead of getting instead of getting sued by the right. Justice Department um, with no penalty, which is the this is the downside, right? They get the leisure <laughs> to say, yeah. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make these changes, and they don't have any penalty in in, in the meantime. Um, so I think that, but other things like the state of California uh, passing a law that doesn't allow for. Um, uh, using of a grand jury, right? Um, right. You know what I'm saying. So yeah. I mean, I think there and there's this, some shifts, right? Right. And then you have city councils, like in New York City and other places, um, you know, challenging the chokehold. Right. So I mean, I think that it was a very robust victory, victories for um, for Black Lives Matter around policing. Um, my, my, uh, I, I would like to see more. I yeah. would like to see people not back off. I would like to not see people get so broad um, with what, they're, what they want to try to accomplish right, because right. I think that they're making real headroads around this issue. Particularly on local levels, right? Yeah. Because politics, first yeah. and foremost, is local. And then in terms of the, the, um, the prosecutor thing, I think it's a, it's a real good example of why we need to be engaged in electoral politics. Right. Now this is something that um, we did one of the rap sessions in um, uh, Philly where uh, Lupe, we were talking about Lupe Fiasco. This uh -huh. was in 2012, and he was uh, we were being broadcast live on the right. radio. Right. He was in the studio in Philly, heard, started listening to us, right. got in the car and drove over to where we were, <laughs> came on stage with us. Right. And one of the things that he was being challenged on around that time was his he was people were saying that he was saying that electoral politics was a waste of time. Right. And what he was saying was, he got more deep into the nuances of what he's saying. He's like, I never said that. I said that presidential politics right. was a waste of time, right. but right. that down ballot voting was Is important. important. Right. And so that's what we see in this case. Right. We see these prosecutors um, in Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, he's a yeah. county, county prosecutor where I live, um, and a real robust conversation. I mean, people were so disappointed with what happened with Tamir Rice. Right. Um, and in the in the context of this larger national conversation around policing, Mike Brown right. and countless other people. Like at this point, I was thinking as I was driving over here, we almost need an encyclopedia. To keep track to of To even right. keep track of all right. the people that are dying at the hands of the police. You, you find yourself doing media and, and having to sit down to yourself and, and write out notes of everybody. Right. Just so you don't feel as though right. you're leaving somebody out. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, and it's enormous. I mean, I think, um, Jasiri X had the song, uh, um, I think it was Strange Fruit, yeah. uh, where he kind of updates right. the various people right. you know, that, that were killed. You and know, and that has to be police. updated from now. Exactly, right, right. <laughs> exactly. It has to keep on, has to keep right, on right. updating. No, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that, that's interesting, we've talked about this before, um, you know, unlike Mike Brown, where it's, you know, folks who are remembering what they saw. You know, we did see Eric Garner, you know, more visibly. But, I mean, everybody got to see the absurdity of the Tamir Rice yeah. shooting. Right. Well, why is it that you think that Cleveland didn't become Ferguson? That's or, a really or good Cleveland question. Cleveland didn't become yeah. Baltimore? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, I've lived in the Cleveland area for about 18 years now. Um, Cleveland is a really, it's a, it's a unique uh, uh, environment in that as one of the former uh, cities that had, you know, this great manufacturing boom of the 50s, 60s, uh, that begins to, you know, you talk about during the election, people yeah. losing, you know, people not having work. Yeah. And we talk about this white, uh, a working class that that's angry at the Republican right. Party. I mean, this is this is where we live. This is where we live in Ohio. Yeah. You know, we we see um, the effect of downsized communities. Just by ex for an example, um, in 1965, the population of Cleveland was like a million. Right. The population of Cleveland right now is less than 400,000. Right. So you have this incredible um, population decline, this incredible kind of shifting of the suburbanization. And this is after Shaker Heights and, and That's right. Right, all this kind of yeah. attempt to manufacture you right. know, diversity in the city. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I think you, so I, so I think that that is the climate in which you're entering and you have this kind of ongoing onslaught of incarceration and uh, 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 policing in these communities that have really removed a lot of folks right. from, you know, uh, right. Lisa Sullivan, who ran an organization called Listen Inc. Yeah. back in the late 80s, early 90s. I know that, I remember that yeah. you knew her because that was one of the things that we had in common mm -hmm. when we first met. She used to talk about 
the natural leadership yeah. and that we should gravitate to who the natural leaders are. That was one of the beautiful things about Ferguson. Right. That natural leadership yeah, right. emerged. They didn't need Al Sharpton. That's, they didn't that's need right. Jesse Jackson. They right. didn't need someone to tell them who their leaders were. Right. I mean, people, the natural leadership just kind of bubbled up. And I feel like one of the things that hap has happened in a place like Cleveland is that natural leadership it's has been, been removed. Right? That's yeah. right. It's been right. removed from the scene. So no, I didn't. We didn't see that. But what we did see was, and this is why I think it was so important what happened with that election. You saw people who knew that it was wrong what right. they did to us. I think the other thing that we see is we see that the the ways in which electoral politics is working at the local level is very different. You yeah. almost don't even really need as a conservative movement that national presidency right. because right. they've been just as effective. Right. This is one what, thing that Jasiri talks about. Right. They're just as effective with Obama as the president right. as they as are. All, all yeah. And, and as, I mean, you look at what's happening in the state of North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. The way that they redistricted everything. They got that whole serpent thing popping off that allowed for the legislature to be flipped, you know, for the first time in a century. Right. You know, where you have a governor basically signing a bill dictating, you know, who can go into a bathroom and not, right? right. So it's like it's 1950s bathroom pol race yeah. politics all over again. Yeah. And again, this has happened in the context of the Obama presidency. Right. So you're right. You know, yeah. They understood the value of the local. I mean, starting with Texas, going back 20 years ago, right. when Texas legislatures, conservatives began to try to flip the state of Texas, yeah. um, you know, that becomes now a strategy yeah, for and it. I, and, and I feel like it's important for people to realize that because I really feel that this is where the battle oh, is, is, is now being waged. Right. It's, the battle is being waged at the local level. The it's the school not, boards, yeah, it's, it's not the city councils. That's right. right. And I think things like Flint underscore that. Right. Things like Ferguson, when we start to really pull back the covers of what was happening yeah, in Ferguson, Ferguson in terms right. of some of the reporting that went on right. with the ways that Of which the, Mike Brown is just a symbolic. That's right. right. So, so Mike Brown allows for this focus to come to Ferguson. Right. So we start seeing these things about warrants and right. the ways in which the, 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 the poor people are being taxed right. for the basically with, with running of the tickets, city. Right. That's yeah. right. right. That's right. So I think that that type of local lies politics becomes important particularly at a time where you know people are really frustrated they're very they people need policy shift yeah. and what happened in cleveland with with uh with tamir rice it was just one step after another people felt like you were living in this quote unquote democracy we have no real pathway to justice yeah. and so one turn after another people are telling us that we just basically have to accept that we don't get justice. Right. And I think that that was the way people responded was in the voting right. booth. And it was interesting. If you get an opportunity to look at it, there was a, um, the Cleveland Plain Dealer published a map of where people voted <laughs> for uh, McGinty yeah. and where they voted for the other guy. It was fascinating because the majority uh, of the people that voted against him were concentrated in the black community. Right. Amongst some of the suburban areas, it was a little bit more split. Yeah. But I think it's important because I think that we have sometimes within a conversation that's always talking about black this and black that and black like we always been black, right? right. We was black in the sixties <laughs> and seventies and the eighties. But some people are acting like, you know, blackness is something new. But even within the context of that, you see um, white folks and other people of color who just are just saying that they can't accept this right that's right who's, who are saying this, this is outrageous this is also right and so i mean it's, that those votes split so you got some people who are crazily saying yeah this is great let's vote this guy in again right but you got other people who well, are still like, pushing back against it. that also and, it, and it's interesting because you know when you look at the you know who's running against mcgintney who's running against alvarez these aren't necessarily progressives right but because they got into office because of a black vote right now the black electorate can hold them accountable yeah. in ways that they couldn't hold the I previous so. owners of, of those yeah. positions I mean, accountable yeah, and the guy who got elected in cleveland is in many uh arguments probably worse than <laughs> but, i mean but it just shows you the extent to which people are starving for justice right. inside of this country. Right. You're willing to vote this guy in, who is arguably worse than the guy, just to send a message to the other guy that we, we know that you, you dropped the ball and you're not representing yeah. us. Yeah. And so it, even though we, you know that you know we don't have, you, you believe we don't have another option. <laughs> 
And so we started to tell people, anyone but McGinty. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? And that became kind of the battle cry. It's almost like, you know, voting for president these days. You know? yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching Left to Black. I'm here with Bakari Kidwana, who is the national director of the National Town Hall uh, Rap Sessions. He's also the author of Why Kids Love Hip Hop and the Hip Hop Generation. Uh, longtime editor of The Source magazine and also an editor at Third World Press. I, I'm gonna switch uh, direction just okay. a little bit. Um, you know, we recently saw the death of Fife from a tribe called Quest. Right. Um, I, were you surprised at all by the outpouring? Of, I was a of, little bit surprised. Yeah. I was surprised, um, and I think mostly because, um, you know, tribe, they were, they were a group that I think that, um, if you were really like a hip hop head, you listen to you, them. You right. listen to them and you understood the right. significance of them. Right. But the av that didn't often translate to the right. average listener. And back in the day, at a time when most hip hop records that were successful were going multi platinum, when folks like Diddy and all those folks are gone. Even right. Public Enemy was going multi platinum right. in, in, the, in those days. I mean, I think it was ninety one or two. They they put a nation of millions. They nine hundred fifty thousand in one week. Yeah. And think Tribe never sold records like that. Right. So they were more of a, you know, you really into hip hop to be vibing with Tribe. I mean, you think about a group like Little Brother here in, right. in North Carolina. I mean, you know, one of their inspirations is a Tribe Called Quest, and in part because they are kind of an underground group. Right. right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was surprised by it on the one hand. Um, but I mean, again, I think it's a testament to the mainstreaming of, of hip hop. Of hip -hop. And, it's, and it's just this raw popu popularity. And, what was interesting, though, was going back and listening to it. I think one of the things that I felt like, as I read through some of the commentary, yeah. people missed some of the subtleties of how much hip hop has changed. Like during the days of Tribe, and I didn't really see anybody kind of commenting on this, we made a clear distinction between groups that were socially conscious right. and groups that were politically conscious. Right. But in some of the revisionist history of this, of this because period, the tropical crest was socially conscious, exactly, they were not politically <laughs> yeah, exactly, con right. Right. exactly. They, but they got thrown in and almost right. even labeled in some commentary right. they, that I saw. They were as not a political they were not <laughs> right. public enemy. Right. They were not right. you know five right. percenters. They weren't Rock right. Kim. They weren't Brand Nubian. But, exactly. they, but they were socially conscious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that was a real hard distinction in hip hop back then. The the the, the, uh, the artists who were kind of the party right. music. The socially conscious, and the then politically the conscious. Political first, yeah, right. and so I think that it's interesting though because it points to, um, I think the when people go, going back and listening to these socially conscious hip hop groups, they're more political in many cases than, what than the contemporary political, political, political ones now, yeah. right? And so I think that's how they kind of get lumped right. in. Yeah, yeah. We've been joined today by Bakari Kidwana. Thanks for joining us, Bakari. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything